Welcome to this episode of Adobe Live. I'm Flynn, and I'm joined by photographer and blogger Pat Kay. What did we cover? Uh, we covered shaping light with local adjustments in Lightroom. Hope you guys enjoy. Hey everyone and welcome to Adobe Live. I'm Flynn and I'm joined by photographer and blogger Pat Kay. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing good. well. Good to be back. Good to have you back. Thank you. We had you on maybe two months ago, mm. um, which was such an awesome episode. We we're talking about photography style. Yes, yes. Which was super, super cool. Jumping into Lightroom. Uh, I've had a lot of awesome feedback on that that we were just yeah. running through yeah. <laughs> in the comment section on, uh, on YouTube. You can check that out. I think it was episode 32. Something you don't like have that. to remember that. That's, yeah, it was close enough. <laughs> it's in there somewhere. I'm sure we have a link uh, that we can drop in the chat at some point as well. So great to have you back. Um, for those of you out there in um, internet land, welcome. If you're watching live, um, you can log in and ask questions as we go. So we're going to jump into some stuff very, very soon. So you can use your Adobe ID to log in just in the top right-hand corner over there, and then you can jump in and ask questions in the chat. If you are in the chat, we'd love to hear from you, maybe where you're from. Um, hey, we got Festus. Welcome back, mate. It's good to see you, um, my good friend Festus from Wellington. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, great to have you back, mate. And uh, yeah, let us know where you're from, and we're gonna get stuck in. We love questions, um, and Pat goes through. A, we got a lot of content to cover, so yeah, should be good. Um, it doesn't matter what level you are at. If you're a beginner or you're very experienced, Pat's the man. So um, we've we've got it covered. So um, maybe for people that haven't seen episode 32, call out, definitely watch that. Um, <laughs> maybe you could give us a bit of an idea of like who you are and what you do. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I'm Pat. Um, I'm a travel photographer and blogger. I do a lot of, uh, a lot of urban, a lot of uh, drone photography as well. Um, I consider myself kind of like a multidisciplinary type creator mm -hmm. um so i do a lot of writing sometimes i do like video and that kind of stuff as well but yeah photography is definitely my my main go-to um mm -hmm. and i love travel content really yeah it's awesome and how much do you how much do you travel it's part of what you do uh quite a bit yeah. you know uh flying out every month or every other month right. um if i can um I'm trying to do as much as I can right now, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes it does get a bit taxing and tiring and all those kind of things. But, yeah, I do a lot. A lot of stuff. Cool. Well, how about we bring up your website? Because this is, you know, we are Adobe, so we like to see some visuals. So yeah. let's have a quick look at your website and the sort of stuff you do. You mentioned um, writing because you do have, like, a really active blog where you talk about your process a lot. Yeah, um, um, which is super cool. I go through a lot of like photography techniques or like gear reviews mm. or uh, you know travel tips, even a whole yep. bunch of different stuff. Mm. Um, come visit my blog. <laughs> hey, Ruben's from Tokyo. Hey, hey, how you doing? Oh. Oh. Hey, Demis. <laughs> <laughs> I see ya. Oh yeah, there's Demis. Hey, hey, mate, how are you? Uh, good friend of the show, Demis Rosley, in there. Um, well, that, that's fantastic. I'm sure there'll be questions about your kit. There's always questions about the kit. There's always questions about the kit. Um, but we are going to be chatting about, about software and specifically Lightroom. Yeah. Yeah, we are. So today we're actually um, going through a lot of my process with what I call like shaping light and local adjustments and stuff mm. like that. Um, super excited to share this bit of process with you because uh, it's, it's one of my, I guess, like I wouldn't call it secret because it's kind of like everyone knows it, but it's yeah, not going to be a secret. It's, in it's the not going to be a secret. Minutes. Yeah, <laughs> soon. <laughs> um, but it's one of the things I focus on all the time to make my images and my editing just a little bit different from everyone else. Yeah. You know, all of us go to like the same countries and, and go to the same spots and sometimes come back with the same images and the same or similar compositions and that kind of stuff. And, mm. you know, oftentimes it's our editing or, you know, slightly different compositions that really mm. make us stand out from one another. So yeah, more tools in the toolkit for you guys. That's awesome. Okay, great. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, hey, everyone in, in the chat that's, that's said hello. Um, as I said, if you're just joining us, feel free to ask questions as we go and uh, we'll do our best to answer them Yeah, on the fly. But why don't we get stuck into this episode? Cool. So in terms of, I guess, shaping light, for me, shaping light is really about finding, I guess, a, a subject or a specific story that you want to tell in your images. Mm -hmm. And it's really like editing the uh, the story around that, 
really. Um, and I do this through local adjustments. And with local adjustments, you know, we can apply contrast, but not just like lightness and, and darkness and that, you know, tonality and that kind of default contrast. Yeah. But also like colors, complementary, clashing and those kind of things, even subjects and all those kind of things. Um, and I'm going to walk you through from end to end, you know, a kind of modular uh, set of ideas and principles that you can apply to any style of photography, every shot. Um, and most certainly um, what I apply or try to apply to every shot as well. Mm. Um, so before we begin, you know, I've got four different examples to show you in a minute, but for some people, you might not actually use uh, local adjustments that often. Mm. Um, so we'll go through a, I guess, a level set of just the basics of the instruments that we're using today. Um, so going into the develop module here, in the top of that, we've got our first local adjustment, and this is the spot removal tool. Cool. Spot removal tool, you could use the Q for a hotkey, is a great tool for you to be able to, let's say uh, you've accidentally left some dust or some dust has got into your sensor, right. you've taken a whole bunch of shots, and every single shot ends up with like a tiny little dot. This tool is the tool for you. Um, it's also really good for super quick uh, blemish um, fixes on like portraits and stuff like that, which mm -hmm. I'll show you in a little bit. Um, but it's also good for removing things. So in this particular instance, we've got a, a shot of a Tori gate from Japan, um, but my eye is immediately drawn to this boat over here on the left. And, you know, I've got no nothing against boats or anything like that, but, you know, just for the sake of this particular um, exercise, Shout I want to try Shout out to boats, they're yeah. totally cool. Right. You guys are going. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, with the with the clone uh, with the clone option here, um, it essentially gives us the option to, if I make a selection, grab the. Well, Lightroom gives you a target or like an origin of where to sample um, a fix from. So zoomed in this far, what's happening here is that like it's essentially a a copy and a paste of whatever is in the the target and paste it into the origin. Right. So it's like one hundred percent. Like one to one. Yes, yeah, straight. Like like a straight grab. Aside from mm -hmm. the feathering that you might put on it, it's a straight grab. Cool. Um, Ravi, there's no practice files for for this particular one because everything that we're going to do here, you can follow along yourself just with Lightroom. Cool. Right. Just answering questions in the chat on the yeah, flat. Love it. Love it. Um, and so that's the clones. Just a straight uh, copy. The heel tool. Um, so we can actually switch this on the fly. For example, um, is a little bit more intelligent, but perhaps uh, for this particular example, I might like move this up just so I can show you guys. The heel tool is a little bit about is a little bit similar to um, the content aware tool for Photoshop. Right. So it takes an average of whatever your your target pixels are and applies that average to the average of your origin as well. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit more, a little bit more thinking, a little bit more thinking, a little bit mm -hmm. more advanced. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes I just leave it on heel because it's, it's mostly good most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, especially when you're trying to match tonality, uh, this is a very simple example because the, you know, it's mostly you know, grays or light blues and there's not a lot going on. Um, but sometimes when you use this tool, it, it it can be a little bit hard to uh, match the right tonality if you're using the clone tool. So, cool. Use the heel. Use the heel, basically. Use the most heel, basically, time. most of the time. Nice. And shout out to everyone in the chat. See some familiar faces: Benjamin L, Ravi, Eric. Cool. Good to see you guys. Yeah. Um, the next tool we'll go through is something that I actually don't use very often at all, mm -hmm. uh, just because I don't use flash and. You know, I don't get into the scenario where I need to correct red eye very often. So if you do need to do that, this tool um, is literally just like you place the cursor on top of the eye and then it just, Lightroom just magically gets rid of it for you. Is red eye still a thing? Red eye still a thing that people people get? Uh, to be honest, don't I don't know. Don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe with like disposable cameras or something like that, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Um, but it's there. It's there. It's an option. Yep. So... Uh, the bulk of this tutorial is really about these last three uh, local adjustment tools. So this first one here is the uh, graduated filter. So this is really a like a drag and place affair. 
is your horizontal line, as you can see there. Um, but what this is doing, if I, you know, change some of the values, is it's replicating the gradual graduated filter in real life. Mm -hmm. So landscape photographers typically, or well, not typically, but sometimes, use this thing called a graduated filter. Essentially, it's a rectangular piece of glass. Right. And the top of that glass is... I guess, tinted or darkened. Um, it has a neutral density effect to it. And then it kind of like uh, feathers itself down or like gets smoother into the bottom half where it's completely clear. Mm. And so when you put this piece of glass in front of your lens and you shoot like, let's say, uh, a landscape and you line up the um, black portion with the sky, it has this effect of reducing the exposure of just the, the sky. Right. And that means that the overall exposure uh, is flatter and you get more detail from the sky without losing detail on the bottom of your image. Hmm. It's pretty neat. So when so when photographers are using are using that, are they trying to line it up, like trying to get it perfect, right? In trying to get shot? it Yeah, mm. all in the singular shot, yeah. Mm. So, you know, there's a, a methodology of like getting it right in camera. Yep. And that's, you know, graduated filters really, really help that. Cool. Nice. So the digital version of that, in this case, is uh, yeah the graduated filter here. If I was to press O, um, it gives us an overlay of where the effect is occurring, uh, just so that we can visually see without you actually making changes uh, wh what's going on. This is for any selection in Lightroom, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Any selection in Lightroom. And as a little tip, um, you can actually hold on to Shift and press O, and actually it, it toggles through different colors for your oh, that's overlay. that's cool. I didn't yeah. know that. Nice. Hot tip. Yeah. Uh, I like to use green. Yeah, thing I didn't know that I learned, number one. Hey, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> there'll, be lots, there'll be lots with Lightroom. It's fine. Um, so I use green because it. I don't use a lot of green in my images just in general. Right. Um, and so if green for me, like, pops straight away. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I can see that. Um, I would use red, but red, I, I sometimes use a little bit of red. And, you know, when you're trying to use... Uh, red overlays with like an orangey red sunset or something like that, then mm -hmm. you know the the colors tend to mix together. So, basics of the grad filter, uh, you can see the two lines at the top and the bottom here. This controls your feather or the the graduation um, of the effect. Mm. So, if I was to make these two lines closer. And I'll grab this exposure just as an example. I wouldn't actually do this in, in any of my images. Um, but you can see the line is really hard. It's pretty harsh. And, you know, sometimes I might be able to get away with that if I, like, maybe do this here. And maybe the effect is not so much. But chances are most of the time you want a graduated look. Cool. Kind of like this. Um, and just so that, you know, the people who are new to uh, local adjustments know what you can adjust here are the basics for you know the overall exposure of your image and obviously your white balance, um, but also you get some effect options like the new texture function um, and like clarity and dehaze and all that kind of stuff as well as uh, detail. You also get this little color picker thing, uh, which we'll go over in just a minute, but that's there as well. So. Um, with that, let me get rid of this really quickly. The next tool across is the radial filter. And the radial filter works very similarly to the graduated filter, but as you probably guessed, um, is a circle. So it can either give you a perfect circle if I hold shift, um, it gives you a perfect circle like this, uh, or you, know, you can have an oval like this. And this is actually, my most used local adjustment tool because it's a little bit different to the grad. And how that works is that the feather is not actually controlled on the canvas, on, on the image itself. Mm. It's actually controlled on the right via a slider. And so most of the time, as like a, I guess, a workflowy type hack thing, um, if you put feather at 100 and put something subtle as your effect, Oftentimes, you can't even see the effect uh, blend into the image. Right. But, you know, it, it's really, really smooth and it doesn't leave any visible traces or anything like that. And it's just a really short way to be able to 
uh, get an effect, a local effect down onto onto your scene. Mm. Now, um, the other real benefit for this particular tool is if I use an extreme example again, um, pretty circles with like super harsh lines, um, is this particular instance affects the inside of that circle. And then if I press the invert, it affects everything outside of the circle. So this actually comes in handy um, when you're thinking about creative uses for the radial filter. So one of them you can you know select or modify everything to do with your subject itself. Mm -hmm. And then the other you can do everything around it. And it's this flexibility that allows you to really start to manipulate the light and the, the shape of your, your scenes. Yeah, cool. That's great. That's a question from Festus. Actually, I hadn't noticed this, but the, the lines in the top left-hand corner, are they like, um, Festus was asking, are they um, jet contrails or something like that? Yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah. I think they were, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, I could easily like spot remove them if I wanted to, but they look kind of cool. They look kind of cool. So yeah. Leave them. <laughs> Um, the last one I want to show you is the brush, perhaps mm -hmm. the most obvious of all of them. It's a brush. Uh, if I have the exposure down, just to show you an example, what we can do is uh, change the size of the brush with the sliders here. Uh, if you have a mouse, you can use the scroll wheel, or if you have a trackpad, you can use two fingers, and that goes up and down as well. From here, you have the feather, which is essentially the circle being your target and then everything outside kind of uh, makes the effect smoother as it goes outwards. Um, and then the flow, if you think about flow in the same vein as like, let's say like an airbrush pen, um, the more you push the effect onto the page, the more it, you know, pastes itself on. Right. And um, you have to keep going over the same spot to have the maximum amount of effect. Mm -hmm. Next is density, which is a great way to think about density is opacity. So if I was to push this up to 100 and then push the density down to like 25 or 26, um, you can see that no matter how many times I go over the same spot, it's never gonna go past that amount. Right. So most of the time I just leave it to 100 and then modulate the flow with the flow. <laughs> right, yeah. okay, cool. So that's the basics. Um, so now we can dive into the creative applications for how we use those tools. So like at a quick glance, these are remarkably different images, right? Like you've got this, I mean, I don't even know what lens you've used for these, but you've, I mean, you've got portraiture, then you've got like sun, sunset, kind of, you know, kind of, sunset, we'll go sunset. Yeah. Um, and then you've got this straight up, like urban, like straight down the middle symmetrical image. Um, so it's interesting that we're going to like apply the same sort of idea to mm. multiple images, which is why obviously you pick them, but it's pretty cool. Like I like to see this at the beginning and see how it ends up. Yeah. Mm. So th this is really around, you know, it, it's more about like an idea or a set of ideas or even like a philosophy about like how you would approach editing just in general. Yeah. Um, and so that's why it can be applied to everything. Um, but as you soon see, like we can actually like tactically apply the local adjustments in this in almost the same way to mm. anything yeah um, and that's why the examples are so diverse awesome so uh we'll dive into the first one and so i've got a shot here of the opera house um i've deliberately shot it one stop under so that i can you know retain the details in the in the highlights um but when i start editing an image the first thing i think about is what is the story here what is the subject? This is amazing. I think Eric may, may know your work quite well because um, he's just asking. You talk about telling stories um, when taking your photos as a way to become a better photographer. Mm -hmm. um, what was the story you're trying to convey with each of these photos? And look at that. Right. Well, there you go. You're about to answer that one. So That's well it. done. So each one, you know, when you think of storytelling, you think about what are, well, especially in photography, it's kind of like what are the elements of the image in and of itself what is the, the relationship between, you know, the light and the subject doing to inspire a, maybe it's a retelling for someone having that experience on, by themselves. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's something that is uh, signifying, you know, your experience and how you portray that to the world as well. There's a lot of different ways you can uh, get into storytelling when it comes to a visual perspective. Mm. In this, I think 
for me anyway, and we're gonna edit this like super, super moody because that's, you know, for me, like uh, speaks truth to the story of like how I like to look at uh, landscapes and, and that kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. um, but for this particular image and for my process, uh, what I'm looking at is before I start any uh, edit, I'm thinking about, okay, where is the subject in this case? The subject is the opera house, it is the light shining down on the opera house, and then there's everything else kind of around it. And so when it comes to shaping light, I really wanna grab that idea and shape my edit around that idea. Mm. So I'll take you through the process. Um, it's basically a, a base grade, um, a base contrast grade, base colors, and then uh, local adjustments on top. Cool. So diving into it, First thing we're gonna do is lens corrections. And for you guys who are a little bit more experienced with Lightroom, you'll notice that the lens corrections panel is the first one here. If you wanna do that for yourself, right click on the heading for any panel, go to customize develop panel, and then you can actually change the orders of the uh, panels depending on what you use. Right, so is that a permanent change? Yeah. So the next time you open Lightroom, it's. Still there? It's still there. I don't cool. want to press save because Lightroom will make me restart everything and mm. it'll relaunch the the uh, editor. Right. But yeah, essentially it, it stays there and you can even turn them off if you like absolutely never use them. Right. Mm, pretty cool. Super powerful. Hey, we've got some questions. We might just do them just before we jump in. Yeah, for sure. Um, Joseph was asking, um, is it, we might get to this maybe a little bit when we get to the portrait one because there are no skin tones in this particular one. So feel free to save this for later. Yep. Um, how can you get perfect skin tones in Lightroom? Yes, skin tones are interesting. Uh, and yeah, we do dive into this in the next yep. image. Cool. But uh, it, you really have to like compare uh, your edit to the original and keep comparing that. Just Otherwise you lose sight of like where the, the, the origin was. Mm. And then you might end up with like Oompa Loompa skin or like really pale, sickly, you know, diseased skin. Anyway, yeah. yeah. Cool, <laughs> awesome. Um, and um, uh, Mut, uh, Mertza, sorry, it's a bit hard to read here. Um, hello, are these options we discuss now in Lightroom on the iPad? Uh, I think most of what we talked about, I think, are definitely clone. Yep. Um, and I think most of those, the radial selection. Not yeah. Sure. So all of all of the local uh, adjustments are available on, I think, all Lightroom CC. Yeah. Apps now. I think so. Yeah. 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 yeah, have a play around yourself, but yeah, I'm pretty sure so far. Yeah, awesome. For sure, it's great. All right, let's get into it. Cool. So after I do the lens corrections, that gives me a good baseline. Uh, what I'm looking to do now is get the image to a point of like flatness where it has the maximum amount of dynamic range, so that I have the maximum amount of information in the actual image itself to work from. Mm -hmm. okay. So I mentioned that I shot this one stop under before. So in Lightroom, I'm just going to enhance this by one stop. Um, and that gives me a good baseline exposure to work with. But now I can press the J key and I can see that, well, the J key actually shows me uh, little points in the image where there is no information. Mm -hmm. So how that works is uh, if I go too high, everything will be red. Right. So all the highlight clip stuff is red, and then if you go too low, all the shadow clip stuff is blue. Mm -hmm. And so that means that there is literally no information in those areas that I can work from. So I wanna make sure that my exposure or my base grade, or my base exposure grade, gives me the maximum amount of dynamic range and the maximum amount of information that I can. So with one, as my base exposure, that's gotten rid of a lot of uh, this uh, missing information, so that's great. Um, I'll go in and adjust my highlights just so that I can get some of the detail back here. Uh, shadows, I'll just play around this with this to taste. Um, again, I was trying to make this as flat as possible. So shadows are up a bit. I might push my whites up a bit, and then my blacks will actually, you know, give me a lot of that. Uh, dark detail back like this. And so this looks pretty flat, pretty mm -hmm. good. If I compare it to the one stop under, that's what it looked like before. This is what it looks like now. And this is a great like level set, a great starting point for the rest of the edit. Cool. Um, we had a question, what's the difference between one-to-one -one previews and smart previews? Uh, so one-to-one -one previews are typically 
huge in size, especially if you shoot on, uh, you know, an A7R, for example, which is like 42 megapixels. So one-to-one -one previews will force you to edit with that particular size. Mm. Smart previews do a, you know, Lightroom does, and depending on what settings you have, um, a down res version of that right so that you can edit in a smaller file and everything's really quick but then when you export it's still one-to-one -one, or right. it's still like proper resolution hmm. so lightroom smart that way it's great lightroom smart um festus was asking we should cover your kit now because it's going to come up um <laughs> the depth of field is in the shot is amazing what was the lens in the f-stop did you say minus one was the f-stop so in terms of what i shot this with um the f-stop for this was f2.8, uh, just because there wasn't a lot of light available. I shot this on an A7R3, yep, A7R3, uh, with a 1635 G Master at 20 mil, 1 over 500, f2.8. Cool. Nice raw. 100. Raw. Raw, obviously. Yeah. Always, always raw. shooting raw. Always shooting yeah. raw. <laughs> yes, always shooting raw. Awesome. Good questions, guys. That's uh, great. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So that's base exposure. Now... The next step is if you caught last time's live stream, mm -hmm. uh, we talked about style, right? Callback. Yeah, mm -hmm. we talked about mood boards. We talked about achieving a consistent visual aesthetic. Yep. Um, loved it. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yep. Um, totally loved back. You too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so with that, we're going to use some of the techniques from that live stream. And if you saw that, we, we actually went ahead and started to create a our own preset yeah. that we can apply to every single image so that we have a consistent base to work from yeah, um, and so that we can start to achieve this consistency. And so for me, um, I've made some of my own. Uh, I've very creatively called them like baseline. Mm -hmm. Just brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> baseline. Yeah. If it was me, I would have called it boilerplate, so it's fine. I yeah. would have just been like, yeah, general, <laughs> general one, yeah, general right. B. <laughs> or just, yeah, just letters and numbers. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, cool. So we've shared the the link to that one. So if you didn't catch that one and you and you want to learn um, everything that we're talking about here, it's a great episode. Check it out. It's about two months ago. Still very fresh um, and very appropriate for what we're about to talk about here. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Awesome. So applying that preset onto our baseline exposure gives me a couple of things. So my particular preset in this instance gives me like, uh, you know, a minus clarity to start with, gives me some color values to start with, but it also gives me a baseline tone curve uh, to start my contrast control with. Mm. And I love using the tone curve for contrast specifically because the curves make uh, the shadows and highlights more or they essentially feel more natural mm. um, and I find that I can have like really granular control by doing so and so I'll control some like global contrast here might bring the shadows down just a smidge and then maybe the blacks down just a smidge too uh, I might even bring up the whites here because I like that that bright spot uh, but I'm just going to leave, maybe, maybe a little bit here. I'm just going to leave that for now and not touch it too much because I'm going to do a lot of the contrast adjustments as local adjustments. So next, I'll, I would usually go into color and start to play around with that and probably spend way too much time uh, adjusting them and you know exporting things to my phones and iPads and laptops and stuff. <laughs> um, for this. I'm just going to adjust the uh, blues just a tad, just to make it a little bit more true to life. Maybe take down the, uh, the saturation as well. Um, and that's fine for now. Uh, I'm going to leave everything else. And from now, I'm going to start with uh, starting to really shape the light and the accenting what I want this particular image to be and to mm -hmm. say. So again, coming back to what I mentioned at the start of this particular edit, um, you know, the subject is obviously the opera house, you know, the light play within the, the right of the scene to the opera house, um, but also like these dark, super, you know, ominous clouds. Um, and I want to really accentuate all three of these things. So the cool. first thing that I'm going to do is head up to 
the radio filter. You did say it was one of your, it was your favorite. This is my favorite, mm-hmm. and no, by no surprise, is the first. <laughs> um, what I want to do is I want to start increasing the light that comes from here, so that I can accre- increase the um, the attention that the Opera House gets. Okay. So I'll just do a real quick, super big radio filter just to start with. I might edit or like change this as we go along. Um, I have a couple of options for making this brighter. Uh, you know, I can just go straight up exposure. Um, I could go maybe highlights. I could go maybe whites. Um, my favorite when it comes to like adding or enhancing light that is already there is a negative dehaze. So a negative dehaze essentially gives you, think of it like like an additive effect. Rather than it changing the values that are in that particular selection, mm. it kind of like adds another layer on top of like white. Right. Um, when you're going minus, that is. Think of it that way. It's not exactly like that, but that's a good way to, cool. to think about it. From there, um, and I might just up the exposure just a smidge. From there, I want to add some more color. Um, and the color options I have right now are obviously white balance. I've got saturation, but you know, saturation, probably don't want to do that just because it looks a bit comical. Uh, but I also have this like weird color boxy thing uh, at the bottom right. Pretty uh, hidden down there. It is. Really? Yeah, and it's it's called the color effect, but you might as well you know, think of it like a color overlay, mm. like uh, yeah. in Photoshop. Photoshop. Um, and this particular one is like super powerful. We can literally add whatever color we want to this particular selection, um, and it kind of like does it in a in an additive way. I want to make this color as like I guess as natural as possible. Um, so it's going to be like an orangey, yellowy type, uh, rich sunset kind of vibe. Mm. Uh, we can control the saturation with the slider down here. So I might. Do, let's say 50% looks good to me. Not so saturated. And then I can augment that with um, some changes on the white balance, just like that. Cool, Ravi has an interesting question. Um, Before you click a picture, do you imagine the final pick in Lightroom and how you can manipulate it? Uh, Most of the time when I'm taking a picture, I'm just thinking about what's going on in that particular scene. Mm. And then I'm thinking about, you know, what story is it trying to tell and what really dra- like draws my eye. Yep. I'm not thinking about the edit until I actually see it because um, I I guess this is a, a kind of old street photographer uh, mentality, but I rarely, after I shoot a shot, look at the shot. So, right, yes. okay. So uh, most of the time I'm actually just shooting, 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 shooting. Um, I know I've got my settings done incorrectly. I know I'm always hitting my autofocus, um, but I actually don't review any of my images until I get them all into Lightroom. Interesting. Why is that? Uh, I, I feel like it it emotionally distances my bias. Okay. So I might like be out on the street, take a photo, and be like, "Oh, that was awesome," but then come back into Lightroom and figure out that it wasn't, mm-hmm. or like. You know, that separation from taking it and reviewing it allows me to look at it a little bit more rationally and assess it in such a way that's like, okay, maybe I was just wrapped up in the emotion at the time, right? Right. So, yeah, that's why I like to, to distance the timing of, of the review. So would you, would so I'm just trying to think about your process. Do you take lots of photos or like how many photos did you take? For this? For this, for example. Not many, like maybe... Of this exact composition, yeah, like two. Oh, really? Maybe one. Wow. So you yeah. will often, so you will often get back home, back to studio. A little bit of time's passed. Maybe it's the next day, the next week, or something. You finally got time to sit down. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, what was I thinking? That's no good. Right. But you've only got two, so you lose lose that shot. What does that force you to do next time you're shooting? So it forces me to really slow down and think about the composition. So I'll take only like one or two shots of a particular given composition like this. I might take it in portrait, I might take it in landscape, but then I'll quickly move on to a different composition. Maybe it's Mm. a couple of feet down, maybe it's like low, maybe it's higher. But I'm constantly thinking about, okay, what's in the scene rather than being like all the time, right? So it forces me to like, especially in like street photography where 
if you find a nice scene and there's a you know a subject walking through, sometimes you need to do the burst. Yep. But if you're focused on the burst and capturing that one slice of time, then at least for me anyway, most of the time I don't explore other different compositions. Mm. And so doing it in this way and slowing down allows me to experiment more and then get more unique shots. Nice. I like it. It's a great question. I was very interested in that as well. Cool. Cool. Um, so I've added some light. Looks good. Uh, what I want to do is further the idea of this um, shaping light idea. Well, set of ideas, essentially. Um, and this really starts with this uh, this whole post-crop vignetting function. Now, mm -hmm. in Lightroom, we can do this till the cows come home, and it looks like decent for some pictures, um, especially if you have like a center-focused composition. Mm. But for other pictures, it doesn't it doesn't work very well. And so we want to make sure, well, in this instance anyway, that the vignette that we put adds to the feeling or the mood of the image and that it's also custom to whatever we're doing. So how I do this generally is I make my own. So we can right click on the pin for this radial filter so that it copies the same overall selection. Uh, I'll just drag that down because when it duplicates, it duplicates on top of each other. So sometimes it's hard to pick. Uh, I can come up here to the right and double click on this effect uh, label and that just gets rid of everything. Now, coming back mm. to O to see where our selections are. So sorry, that double clicking on effect resets everything just to zero. Yep. Everything in the whole Ev thing. Everything, everything that we just went through just then, mm -hmm. but it keeps the original shape. Interesting. What you're doing. Cool. Um, and so with the O selected, we can see that it's affecting the same area as before and that's fine. Um, but what we actually want is to invert that and affect everything else. Mm. So now we're effectively targeting with two radio filters the entire image. Um, with this particular radio filter, uh, what I want to do is start to make things a bit more moody and you know add my own custom vignette. And so if I just slide the shadows down, maybe I'll slide you know the highlights down too, a little bit of exposure. That looks good to me. Might increase my feather just a little bit and then modify the size and the shape of the moodiness. Um, and maybe even move this across to the left just so that it doesn't, uh, so that my opera house is preserved. Um, and so we can start to see that there's a bigger relationship between the subject and the light here. Yeah. So just quickly, if you want to do like a quick before and after type thing, you can press the pipe key and that shows you the before, and then the after again, or you can press the Y key, and that does uh, a side-by-side side uh, Side-by-side's great, isn't it? Yeah, mm. you really tell the difference. Mm. Uh, cool, so we're almost there, but you know, I wanna make things just a tad more moody, so I'll go into the graduated filter, create my own custom uh, heavy vignette here to make it look like it's just about to storm. Uh, Maybe something dark like that. Yeah, that's cool. Great. Um, and so there's a relationship between you know the darkness and the lightness and this idea of shaping light and this idea of contrast and tension and excitement mm. um, that I love to put in my images and you know especially this this idea of of, of contrast and tension is is something that I try to strive for in, in every image. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is a really quick way to do that. Just as a uh, final finishing touches, I mentioned before that I have a like a global minus clarity most of the time. And so that means that everything is kind of soft. Um, so the things that are supposed to be your subject or you know the lines that are supposed to be leading towards your subject need to be, in my opinion, uh, sharp or they need to stand out in some way. Mm -hmm. And so again, we'll go back to our trusty radial filter and we'll just have a quick selection around the Opera House itself. We had some old settings on there, so we'll double click the effect again. Um, and w that minus clarity I had before, I will plus clarity on, on it now so that it kind of like offsets itself. Um, I'll also add, you know, maybe a couple of other small adjustments to the overall exposure of that area and push the feather up so that it looks like I'm not making any changes to that at all. Um, 
And then that's kind of it for the opera house. Um, I see that this light is probably a bit too hard, so I might even take the feather down just a smidge like that. Just so that things look natural, right? So you don't want like heavy lines. You don't want to. You don't want to look at a picture and be like, "Oh, he used radio filter there." Right. Um, right. Something natural, something organic. So the next thing I'll probably do is I'll grab the brush tool up here on the top right, and I want to, in this instance, uh, accentuate the the leading line towards the subject, which in this instance is this uh, the seat. Um, so I'll up the highlights. I'll up some clarity, maybe some white, smidge of exposure, and maybe a little bit of color because it's it's going to be that color anyway, with you know a, a sl smaller flow and like a high feather. Um, I'll just start to to slowly brush that on, just like this. And it's cool. You can really notice the difference. Yeah, like straight away. And it, you know it's a progressive thing as well. Um, you can keep going on the same spot forever, but you want to, it's easier to add in layers than it is to subtract in layers. Right. Um, so try and have that as a practice. Uh, maybe I'll just up this just a smidgen more. And if I go to O, it looks real rough. Yeah. Um, but it's it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, by I is, is the, you know, essentially the final uh, guide that you want to go off. Right. Uh, you know, if it looks good by eye, then it doesn't really matter what the overlay says, right? Yep. Um, cool. But essentially, that's it. So to recap, um, we've got one, two, three radio filters here. We've got, you know, a uh, gradu graduated filter up here in the top. Uh, we've got some brushes down here for the actual, like, uh, I guess the leading line into the subject. Um, from here, I could spend another, you know, half an hour maybe popping these clouds out and making them a little bit more textural or ominous, right. or I could start painting the sails of the opera house and, you know, start working into to those kind of details. Mm -hmm. um, and it's totally up to you how much time you want to spend on on an edit. Uh, sometimes in, in the case of this, when I originally did this, yeah, it took me like an hour just because you know, an hour seems like a long time, but like when, <laughs> when you're working on it, it just time flies. Yep. Um, and the more attention to detail you have, you know, the more practice you get at picking things out like that, the better you get at like shooting in the field and looking for those things while you're shooting as well. So not only does having the discipline to, to do those things in post give you like the effect here, but it also gives you uh, a level of intentionality you can bring into uh, actually shooting it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, looks great. So before we go on to the next one, take a break, because that was awesome. Um, I like that you showed us, showed us the three and then you applied all three in that first image, which is super cool, um, all three different versions. Let's answer a couple of questions. Yeah. What do you do say? Um, let me see. Where were we up to? Um, Joseph was asking, do you shoot uncompressed RAW or compressed RAW? So I spent a lot of time trying to uh, find out the benefits uh, uh -huh. of either or especially for the file size and especially when, you know, an uncompressed raw shot from an A7R3 is literally editing 80 megabyte files every time right. versus 40 megabyte files every time. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, there is actually not much benefit to shooting uncompressed for a Sony camera. Right. Um, the only benefit you get from uncompressed is if you're shooting into a super high dynamic range scene. So into a sunset, for example, where like mm. the sky is super bright and like the shadows are super dark. Right. So that's the only time you would ever need to use uncompressed. Right. Cool. Very good. Thanks, Joseph, for the question. Uh, Festus asks, do you manually, do you try to manually do HDR shots of the same settings like this or do you use auto HDR? In camera? I don't do HDR at all. Don't do HDR? No. So for high dynamic range shots, like for the, I'm not trying to plug Sony here, um, but for the Sony shots that I, I do on the um, A7R3, the 15 stops dynamic range is more than enough in terms of like how far you need to push a file. If there's ever a case where I need more dynamic range, then I'll shoot in brackets and then like manually, uh, manually in Photoshop, like push in the, the detail where I need that. Mm. But yeah, I, I very rarely do, if ever, HDR. Cool. Um, thanks for the question. So Ivan was asking, do you use any ND or polarized filters? 
for your photos? Yeah, so ND for for my photos, sometimes I use NDs, um, depending on what I'm doing, long yeah. exposures, typically. So I usually use like a 10 stop or a six stop. Um, otherwise, I'll only use NDs for like video. And that's kind of it. Polarizers are good too if you're shooting for water and you have lots of reflections and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, but I tend to use polarizers on my drone shots more than my handheld shots. All right. Cool. It's interesting. Um, our buddy Ben asks, any tips on mimicking light and having it look natural or just generally understanding light? Yeah. So the first thing is directionality. Um, you know, coming back to this, it's obviously here mm. and moving to the left. Um, I, I see a lot of people trying to add light where it didn't exist previously and mm. then the shadows don't line up or, you know, you can, you can always tell when uh, fake light or enhanced light wasn't placed in the original position. Right. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing was really around the options that you choose to enhance that light with. So again, like I use minus dehaze quite a bit. Um, just because I feel it looks more natural for my whimsical, like soft looking style. But some people might find that, you know, just upping the exposure and then, uh, you know, maybe controlling the highlights a little bit works for them too. Um, a more advanced option is actually to play with luminosity. So where you have the luminance values down here, if say for example, uh, you want these bits to be brighter, or like, you know, there is a little bit of sun peeking through or something like that, your luminance values often change the, you know, how much intensity of that light is mm -hmm. there. So I play with luminance probably the most out of all three of these things um, because that often affects like not only the color, but the hue and the intensity of that as well. Mm. Cool. Good questions. Oh, there's a lot. Keep coming in. Sweet. We might need to. We might need to move on. Maybe we'll ask one more question. Yeah. Um, um, what do people mean by deep contrast and deep colors? Deep contrast and deep colors. Mm. Did we mention that? Uh, not too sure. But maybe you need I, to clarify that question as I, we move on. I assume you you mean something like dynamic range or like how much available color there is in a in a given uh, in a given scene, I guess. Mm. But um, yeah, probably range. Cool. Yeah. Feel free to clarify. Yeah, feel free to clarify in there, um, and we'll get some more questions at the end. I know there's a couple in there, but we'll we'll continue on because we've got some more stuff to show you guys. Cool. Yep. So we'll dive into the next one um, and eventually use those three uh, three tools again. This is a portrait of my friend Georgia. Um, we shot this earlier this year during cherry blossom season, and again before I even touch anything with editing the image, I'm looking at what do I like about this photo. What's the subject doing? What's the story here? Um, and I shot this photo in this particular pose because of um, the shadow in her face. So she's got this like, um, you know, shadow on her eye. Mm. Um, it's a shadow of a cherry blossom. And I thought it looked rather interesting. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I kept at it. And I really want to, in this case, uh, bolster that, that look. Mm -hmm. I want to pop that out somehow because I think that's, it's interesting, it's not your regular portrait, um, and it's just something different. Uh, so again, we'll start with lens corrections, bang, bang, super easy. Um, gear, just to get that out of the way. Uh, same setup, A7R3, 1635, this was at 35, one over 2,500. We were on a boat, it was really rocky. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of wind, so I needed a really fast shutter speed and that's what I got. Right. Uh, F2.8 and ISO 100. So again, uh, we're looking at the baseline exposure grade here. So I'll hit J and we can see that the back of her hair is clipped and there's no data there. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll up the exposure just a smidge like that and I'm watching the highlights uh, and especially up here and watching whether or not they they clip or they're too bright or too hot. In this instance, they're fine. Um, you know, I could move the highlights, but I actually kind of like where they are at, at the minute. Shadows, I see this area behind is really dark. And so again, I'm trying to get to the point where this entire image is flat. So. I'm just gonna up the shadows just a smidge like this. Whites are good where they are, I think. 
And then black, again, is going to give me that detail back uh, right there. So I think that's pretty good. And that's pretty flat. So again, hit the pipe. That's what it looks like before and after. Mm. That's just a flat, flat image. So we'll come over to our trusty baseline. Yeah, uh, here we are. <laughs> um, and you know, there was a question around like skin tones and stuff like that before. So I've got a whole bunch of different presets here, and all of them affect uh, yellows and oranges in terms of hue and saturation and luminance differently. Mm. So. Not too sure if you can see it on the monitor here, you know, colors change all the time. But for this baseline, this is probably more true to life than this, for example. Right. So this one is a little bit more saturated, um, a little bit more, uh, I guess, tad more darker in luminance and a little bit more towards the orange end. Um, if I was to choose this, for example, um, a good thing to do is, you know, flip between the back and forth. And you can see does the original skin tone match what you're what you're doing in the edit? Mm. Um, and that's a really good way to be able to to make sure that you're you're safe when it comes to to skin tones. So for this example, we're going to go to the regular baseline because as we can see, the skin tones are very similar in color mm. and and tone. Um, and then again, you know, we've got clarity, vibrance, saturation, etc. Um, and we've got a custom tone curve uh, that we've just got a good baseline for. So we'll adjust our contrast. I'll tackle the, the shadows first. So again, not too much um, at a global level anyway, because we want to do the contrast at a local level. Um, and then maybe the blacks down here. And that's totally fine. Not clip in, it's all good. Um, so here, again, with the tone uh, for like skin tones and stuff like that, watch out for your oranges. Your oranges are huge. Um, and then watch out for your luminance. Your luminance will really affect how bright the skin ends up becoming. Mm. From there, you can modulate like how much saturation value you give that. Um, this particular preset is already optimized for like natural skin tones, which is why you can see it's like slightly desaturated, but slightly increased on the luminance, but it stays at zero for the hue because I want to keep the original values there. Mm. And that means from a preset perspective, sunsets, for example, aren't that great with this uh, particular preset if right. you want to make your oranges any different. So when you're creating and crafting your presets, you have to think about, okay, what are the different use cases and the different hues that are going to appear in a given scene and, you know, change those depending on, on what you're doing. And most of your presets would exist because it's something that you found yourself manually doing so often to a type of photo, right? Right. So then you're like, great, I need a shortcut for this because I'm doing the same basic stuff almost every single time I do a portrait shot. 100%. Or almost every single time I do a landscape shot. Right. So. And then those different types of shots require different, like completely different color palettes and all these kind of things. Mm. So, you know, even here in the baseline, I've got this thing called green save. It's because the original baseline actually desaturates greens like like crazy. Right. Um, but if I ever have like a scene where I do want green, then this is that preset for that. Need to save those greens. Got to save those mm. greens. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> um, so colors, again, I would spend a bit of time trying to uh, fiddle around with getting the colors right at this point in time, even before I've done all the local adjustments and stuff, and then I'll do another round after that. But for this example, we'll leave that as it is, uh, and we'll get straight into um, the local adjustments. So first thing is coming back to, I think it was Ben's uh, feedback or question on um, making light look natural. This particular one, you can obviously tell that the light is coming from the left. Right. That shadow is a dead giveaway. Dead giveaway. <laughs> so we want to mim mimic that, right? Mm. Um, so again, a trusty radial filter. Uh, we'll neutralize all of that and we'll uh, draw a big old circle here and we'll uh, end at her face. Um, just like that. Uh, and again, my favorite way to do this is dehaze and minusing. And then I might even add a little bit of um, exposure to this also. Um, now, obviously, the sun is more of a yellowy 
color, especially in like the beginning or ending of the days. So I might like just add a smidgen, not a lot. And this is just like a good first pass um, because what I want to do now again is make my own custom vignette based on where the light is falling. So I'll move that down. I'll double click on the effect again and I will untick the checkbox for invert, which if you press O, um, gives us the effect of everything else. I might move this further across, just like that. And then I'll start making everything moody again, because that's what I do. Um, <laughs> you need a moody slider. Yeah. It's just the Pat, oh, Pat K I, moody slider. Can I have my own slider? Yeah, we'll, we'll put that in development, no worries. <laughs> I, <guess. Yeah. laughs> I have that kind of power. <laughs> um, I don't have that kind of power. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll drop the exposure down a little bit and this is a good first pass, I think, um, for like a, my own custom vignette. Just really quickly, press the pipe button, have a look. We're starting to add artificial light here. Mm -hmm. We're adding a directionality. I think this to me, to my eye, looks a tad fake, a tad bit fake. So in order to make it look a little bit realer, we can do things like increasing the feather, which decreases the overall effect, but it decreases it to such a, such a way that you can't tell where it starts and ends. Mm. Um, so if I drag this across and even pump up the dehaze just a little bit more, for example, just a smidge like that. And then, you know, maybe I up the exposure just to even out the overall image just a little bit more. Maybe, yeah, maybe that's a bit too much as well. It's all a experimentation process, mm. really. It's like a lot of trial and error. It is a it? lot of trial and error, and it's always different for every image as well. So, mm. you know, especially when it comes to presets for local adjustments, very rarely are they ever like spot on, which is which is why I never include them in, in any of the presets that I do. So I think that's okay. Um, as a good starting point. Color-wise, I like everything blue, so I notice that this is a very yellow uh, image. So I'm just gonna, at a global level, just slowly slide over the uh, white balance. Um, coming back to the idea of color contrast, not just like um, luminosity contrast of like light and dark. If I, you know, I've got this like yellow-y kind of tinge over the top of the, uh, the light here and then I can actually for the shadows do the opposite of that so that we start to contrast the colors too so not only is this a con uh, contrast in terms of you know color it is luminance it is dark, light and dark and you know as many for me as many different contrasting uh, components as you can put into an image um, as possible you know the more the merrier really cool so the next kind of thing I want to do is perhaps uh, something that, well, it's new, so maybe not a lot of people know about this one, um, but that's actually probably too, sorry, Georgia. It's a bit <laughs> too much zoom there. <laughs> um, so we'll grab our radial filter again, and I want to like try and enhance like the shadow of this a little bit. And what I can do here is, if I grab this range mask option down here, and I go to luminance, what this effectively does, it says, it's saying, hey, of this selection, right, in this range, do these things. Right, does okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So, for example, if I go show luminance mask, right, it turns everything black and white, and then, you know, you have red. Mm -hmm. Um, if I drag the ranges, you can slowly see that certain areas are getting less and less red, just like this. Mm. So that means that as a shortcut, you know, you're only affecting the things that you need it to affect. Um, and sometimes this has a like, a, like a big drastic effect on depending on your selection and sometimes it doesn't. Mm. In this case, I just want something super subtle and super, super light. Um, and so that is okay for me. You can also have the eyedropper tool and you can like make a selection like this. Um, and that kind of like grabs, you know, the overall tonality of, of that thing. So this is kind of hard cause they're very similar in tones, but mm. it kind of looks like this. Um, and so I probably want more like, 
Yeah, maybe more like this. Smooth this. I'm going to drag that down. Smooth this is like intensity, right? So the more you have, the less effect. The less you have, the more effect. So because this is a shadow and it's a fairly, like, uh, like the edge, like the, it's fairly, almost looks like a stencil on top of her face. Naturally, mm. you're actually trying to select it very, S like very particularly, very particularly. Yeah. And of course, I could just grab the brush and like trace over it and stuff like that right. as well. Uh, I don't have a mouse with me today, but <laughs> you know, I could do that. Um, either way, this is an easy way. Once you get like really quick with the the range masking, mm. it's like I do it all the time, it's just so much faster. Yeah, and there's no room for error, right? Like if you're actually painting something, then you can actually make mistakes and have exactly. to do it again and have to do it again. Stuff. Yeah. And especially if you're doing only something subtle, like this is, again, like a barely noticeable change that mm. you'll end up seeing, but it's the, the accumulation of all these different smaller changes that makes all the difference. Mm. So with this, I wanna just lighten this down a little bit. Maybe not so much. See, when you have it too much, right? Like it starts to look a little bit weird. Um, but just subtlety, right? It's like a Mike Tyson tattoo, you're turning it into. Yeah, but I just want to enhance that a little bit more. And it's and it's super subtle like that. Awesome. And that's kind of it. Mm. Um, you know, from there, I might do stuff like maybe my own harder vignette down here or something like that. And I could, you know, duplicate this and have that come behind her or something like that, mm. the high fade. A whole bunch of different directionality techniques. So, you know, if if we know that the light is facing this way, for example, um, I can actually shape this graduated filter so that it like cones into that direction like this. And so we're really emphasizing the directionality here. Mm. But yeah, so to recap, we've got uh, one, two, three radial filters. We've got two graduated filters. We've got, well, no brushes in this particular one. Um, but now we've completely shaped the light. So for, mm. for the before and after, looked like that. Looks like this. Yeah, wow. Looks awesome. You know, next to each other. Mm. Looks completely different. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. I love it. Cool. I love it. Obviously, yeah. If we had now a little bit more time, we could do the whole. We could do the whole other one. But it is. It is the same sort of process, right? Right. It's the, yeah. Exactly. It's the the same sort of process with uh, every single image that you do. Um, you can think about what does the subject, and then uh, how do you accent that in the best way possible. Mm. Awesome, man. I love hearing you talk about your work. It's so cool. <laughs> Um, so we actually had quite a few questions that came through. Thanks for thanks for sort of sticking around, being patient while we made sure we got through everything. Why don't we answer yeah. some of those? Let's we'll see how it. we go. Um, how long do you take to edit on each photo on average from Ad Adnan? Uh, I probably take longer than most, I guess. Yeah. Um, but again, like it depends on how much of a match my my preset is uh, for what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, but it may maybe anywhere between like. 15 minutes to an hour, just depending. Yeah. Uh, I like to take a lot of time with the, my images. Yep. Cool. Great question. Um, and Jonathan was asking, what file format do you normally save out to? I guess that probably depends on what you're using the file for, right? Like, are you storing it for later or are you pushing it to Instagram or mm. publishing it in a book of some kind? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I try and be as simple as possible when it comes to file formats. Mm. Um, it's just raw as it comes in and then it comes out as a JPEG, really. Um, and then if it's ever going anywhere else, like like if you really wanted to get specialist about it, sometimes it goes on WebP for my, my blog and all that kind of stuff, but mm. that's kind of it. Yeah, cool. Cool, cool. Eric, long one, I'm gonna do my best here. So assuming that you have a few presets for a myriad of different types of photos, how do you decide what your presets are and what panels do they usually manipulate for your baseline photo? like basic tone curve color. Right. We sort of, uh, maybe we covered that um, since you asked the question. Yeah, it's, yeah, we, we kind of did. Um, you know, it, it, it is, it does come down to, if I had to put it into a nutshell, I guess, um, what are the things that you do constantly over and over again? Mm. You know, uh, at a basic level, uh, I always do the same amount of sharpening, for example. I always do, well, usually this is set at like 10, mm. I always usually do like the same baseline vignette. Um, you know, Transform is obviously specialist. 
I do the same colors depending on the thing. And, you know, it's whatever uh, you find yourself repeating all the time. Right. So maybe it's something that if you're if you're new to Lightroom or you're just getting started or you've never done presets before, maybe you need to think about it consciously. Like what action am I constantly finding myself I'm redoing mm. that could that I could speed up in the future? Right. Go, go out and shoot 500 photos, come back and be like, OK, what am I doing constantly here? Right. Like, what do I have to keep doing on and on and on? Yeah. Yeah. Once you get to the 250th photo, you'll go, OK, I'm pretty sure I know what Pat was talking about. Right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, what's your shoot, edit, upload workflow like? I think we spoke a lot about that, I think, Vishal. But is there anything to add about your workflow from um, shooting to uploading? I guess the I guess the, the minutia is that uh, I shoot SD cards straight into the, the computer via SD, not through USB-C, although that does sometimes as well. Edit is usually quite far on in the picture. I'm always doing like um, initial picks and selects first. Mm -hmm. So using the quick select tool or using the flag tool. Um, and then I might leave it sit for a while and then uh, I'll go and, you know, export and upload. You find that you need to take a break from, keep a gap from between sort of once you've sort of brought everything in and shortlisted everything and then Go have a coffee or something and then come yeah. back and go, okay. Yeah, oftentimes it's like, it's it's so taxing being like, okay, that was crap, that was crap, that was crap. Oh, that was good. Oh, that was crap. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do you ever get someone else to look at your work and then they select it? Never. Never done that? I've, I've heard of people doing that. Yeah. And I've heard of people like having pure like editors and stuff like that. Right. But I love the editing process too much to give it up. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Nice and hands-on. I like it. Um, I think this question came up last time you were on, if I remember correctly. Lighton was asking, um, Linton, sorry, was asking, sorry if I get someone's name wrong today. Um, is there an advantage in using the tone curve versus sliders? Yeah, so the tone curve versus sliders is is interesting. A lot of people think they do essentially the same thing and they do look like they do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But actually both of those different options affect the histogram in different ways. Yeah. Um, and so a great way that, um, and I was explaining this before, um, that I like to use it is using the basic sliders for your baseline exposure so that you can get the maximum amount of dynamic range to work with mm. and then using the tone curves on top of that to manipulate the values of your full range. Right. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Joseph was asking, this question might be more for me in Adobe than it is more for Pat, but it takes me four minutes to fully load my Lightroom. I use one catalog for all my photos. Is this the issue? It could be. It depends on your rig. Uh, just get a 1080 Ti uh, and you'll be totally fine. Um, look, uh, it's you know it depends on your setup. It depends on your RAM. It depends on your storage capacity. It depends on if mm. you're using SD versus HD mm. um, and other acronyms um, that could be involved. For reference, I use only one catalog for every single one of my photos. Right. Um, my entire collection is all on one catalog, but my hack is using like an SD. Uh, okay, yeah, it's that big. Yeah. Um, it's so small you can't even see it. On you camera. can't even see it. Um, it. I use an SD and then I use smart previews to edit my photos. That mm. way things don't chug along. And Yeah, as a um, new owner of an SD, like that, that has a huge storage capacity. Even even though I'm not a photographer, it's amazing. Yeah. It's such a life-changing kind it? of thing. Yeah, you could never imagine going back <laughs> from <laughs> SD. No, uh, yeah, and, and, and I use SSDs for everything now. Like, I couldn't go back to, like, a traditional disk-based hard drive. Yep. Seems so archaic, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Floppy disk. <laughs> Is this 2019 or what? And last <laughs> last question, um, my man Festus. Uh, can the radial filter be tweaked like you're using the Lasso 2 tool to draw it or uh, to cover unique blends like uh, photo, like noses, etc.? So I guess can you can, once you've selected the radial thing, can you go in and kind of select it even in more detail? Yeah. So I actually didn't show this, um, but what we can do is say I have this like color, right? Mm. So uh, I can actually go up to here to the brush and I can actually brush in this particular effect anywhere else on the image that I want to as well. Right. Um, so if I go to O, you can see that that's where the effect is occurring. If I actually hold onto option, it changes into an eraser. So then I can, you know, erase the parts that I've uh, had. Mm. But the problem is when you have things that have a high feather like this, so this is like a computer generated nice looking feather. When you try and like get rid of it or like you accidentally take a, a part of the gradient out of the feather mm. and you try and like, say for example, re-add it really like 
slowly or with a high feather, it kind of like never looks the same. Right. Uh, so, you know, like even that I can see like it's blotchy, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, watch out for that. It's possible, but you probably, I assume you don't use that terribly N much. No, no, I don't. Um, okay. You know, in a case like, I guess, uh, like this one, for example, where we had, uh, where are we? Oh, anyway, for this one where we had the um, radio filter up here, I could have easily used the shadows down here instead of like creating my own, um, mm. my own there. Um, and you can just like brush in the same effect anywhere you want. But yeah, cool. Um, last, actual, real last question. Yeah. Um, can you do this stuff in Photoshop? Pros and cons um, from David. I mean, a lot of the like tools do exist. Like you can adjust a lot of the things. But I mean, having the f the freedom and to be able to move around quickly is it's quite unique to Lightroom, especially the way I've seen you use it. Yeah, exactly. You know, a lot of um, portrait photographers love to use things like. I'm sorry, Georgia. Um, like frequency se separation for cleaning up blemishes and stuff like that, mm -hmm. or like skin tones and those kind of things. And whilst those things are great and can take you, you know, half an hour, or an hour to do, you know, one or two taps of, you know, the spot tool, for example, gets rid of a whole bunch of that stuff. Right. Like really quickly. So, I mean, the short answer is you can do everything you can do in Lightroom in Photoshop for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but how much do you need to get done and how fast can you get those things done? Cool, perfect, perfect answer. Well, that's been amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for coming on again. I'm sure we'll have you back again in the yeah. future. Happy to be back on, of course. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Some awesome questions. Um, if you are watching this on YouTube, let us know down in the comments below what you thought. Um, we'll keep an eye on that um, for sure. And um, yeah, like and subscribe and all that stuff. We'll be back here um, Wednesday. So we're live every Wednesday. And next week it is from 2 p.m. Uh, with an After Effects tutorial with Ben Marriott. So check mm. it out. Thank you very much, Pat. No worries. Cheers. See you guys. Cheers.